Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. And we're going to get going, I think. Um, my name is Marsha Meskimen, and I'm the director of the Institute of Advanced Studies. And I'm not going to overplay this. I'm going to listen, because this is going to be an exciting event. But I want to welcome everyone. Um, to uh, this collaborative um, design leadership summit. This is actually the second in a series of design leadership summits that we have worked. Um, the Institute of Advanced Studies has uh, partnered um, with the uh, School of Design and Creative Arts at Loughborough. Um, and when we um, first began to do these summits and we, we held one at International House and of course it was pre-pandemic and it was a wonderful, wonderful meeting space. And so I'm very much hopeful that this will be a, the same kind of wonderful meeting space and meeting of minds and, and, and ideas, but that we will also host a number of you um, uh, in the flesh in the new year at some point when we are all able to do that. So we are very much looking forward to also being able to welcome you to Loughborough at some point. But I welcome you virtually at this moment for that. And um, we are thrilled to be able to partner with um, the School of Design and Creative Arts to really look at these leadership summits in key areas um, that uh, Loughborough has uh, research strengths in. And most importantly, areas where we are both, um, you know, have led for a long time and are able to bring people who are major, major pillars in their field in these areas together, but also people who are setting agendas for the future. And the um, concept of, of applied storytelling and, and the work that Mike and Antonia and others and your collaborations, um, long-term collaborations with many of the people who will be speaking here, and we welcome you um, to this summit for that, are really pivotal in thinking about some quite important uh, areas for future development. And I think at this moment, this moment when we might have had a little bit, a little bit of an international um, moment of joy, and, and for the first time, at least my own personal sense of my ballot counting for the first time in a number of years, um, I can say uh, that I hope maybe we are turning a corner into some things where there is a little bit more productive and particularly international discourse and, and discussion and debate as opposed to always looking for some kind of oppositional way to imagine the world. And um, so I hope that this is part of that. And I'm going to turn over to Mike and Antonia who are going to chair and then welcome our speakers. So welcome very much to the, in, in the virtual IAS and I hope to see you in, in due course in the new year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcia. I'm not sure whether to look at this. I know I need to look at this screen, but there's a big screen over here. So, so if I keep doing that, it's because I'm distracted by the, the size of the big screen over here. But um, good afternoon, good morning, um, um, good evening maybe to some, to some colleagues, depending where you are exactly. Um, it's an absolute delight um, to welcome you all. My name is Mike Wilson. I'm um, Professor of Drama and Head of Creative Arts at um, Loughborough University and the School of Design and Creative Arts. Um, and I also um, head up the Storytelling Academy. Um, and I wanted to say, um, first of all, very welcome to you all on behalf of both the School of Design and Creative Arts and the Storytelling Academy. Um, when we um, first planned this, um, uh, well, first of all, we were planning to do this, as, as you will probably remember, back in um, April, and of course we had to postpone. And when we decided to put it um, in the second week of November, in the middle of a pandemic, we really weren't quite sure how we'd be feeling um, at this point. It's, it's really a great pleasure to be able to say that we're meeting in an atmosphere of, of great optimism, um, which we perhaps weren't quite expecting. Um, we all obviously have the, the very good news on the, um, on the development of the vaccine for coronavirus, um, and we're hoping that that will enable us in due course to welcome you all onto, onto campus here in Loughborough. And of course, we also want to extend a particular welcome to all our American friends this week. Although I do have to say, you certainly put us through the emotional ringer last week. And it's gonna take a little time for us to forgive that, I think. But um, you're very, very, you're very welcome. And I say that because optimism is incredibly important. And I hope you'll just indulge me for a few minutes to talk about storytelling and optimism as a way of just kind of setting the scene for our discussions over the next couple of days um, because I think optimism is actually the the underpinning 
um, philosophy, if you like, of applied storytelling. In fact, one might even say we, um, we harbour a bit of utopianism in, in what we do. Um, when people ask me what applied storytelling is exactly, I, I think of it myself in the same way that we talk about applied theatre. So it's storytelling that is applied to a range of different um, social contexts. In other words, I think of storytelling um, as being storytelling with social purpose. Um, and um, although we are at the beginning of, of, of our optimistic journey now, um, and um, as our friend um, um, Joe Lambert, who I think is on the line, would, would probably say, there is story work still to be done. Um, and certainly there is, um, and we're hoping to make a start on that in the next couple of days. Um, we work, um, we've been working here for about six years now at, at Loughborough and in that time we've been involved in um, getting on for 30 different projects um, which have taken place um, across, um, well in North America, South America, um, Africa, um, Asia, um, Europe and Australia, so really every continent pretty much apart from the Antarctic at the moment is where we've been working. Um, and we've been working across areas of health, education, environment, and social justice. Um, and it is the nature of that work, which means it is always interdisciplinary. We're always working with colleagues um, from um, medical sciences, environmental sciences, business, social sciences. In fact, um, any, any part of the academy I think is an area in which we like to work and we find colleagues to work with. And of course, we're always work, also working with non-academic colleagues from colleagues in institutions and, and businesses, as well as NGOs, and they're a huge range. Um, whether that is working with um, small grassroots activist organizations in the informal settlements in, in Nairobi, and I think Daniel, Onyango is with us, with us today from Kenya, and it's delightful to be able to welcome Daniel, um, all the way to um, one of the greatest cultural institutions in the world, the Smithsonian. And we know we've got um, more colleagues from the Smithsonian that I've got time to mention by name um, today. But um, that gives you a range of the kind of um, people that we're working with, the kind of people who we call our friends and colleagues and partners. So a big welcome there. Um, it's an interesting to exciting time for us at the moment. We've just started um, a new MA in storytelling and some of our students are, are behind me at the moment. So they're going to be introducing our speakers um, over the next couple of days. Um, and we've also just got word that we're gonna be able to start a new postgraduate certificate in storytelling, which is going to be delivered um, remotely in an online environment um, from February um, next year. So um, exciting times for us. Um, underpinning our work is this idea that storytelling is a knowledge system. The storytelling is a way of thinking about the world and it's a way of knowing the world. Storytelling is a way that we interrogate truths. Um, it's a way that we help us discriminate between truths and untruths. Um, and stories themselves are ways of organizing and thinking about our experiences. But stories aren't, aren't fixed. Stories themselves are fluid and they change. They come into, when they come into contact with listeners and when they come into contact with other stories. And that's the process that we call storytelling. And that's why we're a storytelling academy rather than a story academy. Um, and it's that fluidity that uncertainty that even one might say the unreliability of story is what we need in times of fluidity and uncertainty and unreliability. Um, it, what keeps us um, thinking imaginatively and flexibly when it's needed at a time when we really need to be at our most imaginative and flexible. Stories are the friend of truth and science, not its enemy. But it's that that gives us the optimism that we have. 
and the optimism that we understand storytelling as a force for optimism. Um, very often, if I think about um, traditional stories, the older stories, the, the, the folk tales, the fairy tales, a criticism that is often leveled at them is that they're, they're conservative in nature that they simply reinstate a status quo. Um, but for me, I would rather agree with uh, my friend and the great fairy tale scholar um, from the University of Minnesota, Jack Zipes, who talks about fairy tales as an emancipatory force. Whilst fairy tales take place in a pre-industrial, agrarian, even a feudal past, they speak always to our present predicaments and they speak always of a brighter future. These stories take place in a world that is like ours, but is not ours. They look forward, they don't look back. They take place in a world of social inequality, but one where the poor and oppressed always get the better of their exploiters, where Jack can always find his fortune and marry the princess. A world where anything is possible, where magic happens. A world where the poor survive and win, bettering the rich and powerful through their intelligence, their cunning, guile, kindness to others and the environment, hard work, tenacity and honesty. In other words, it's a world where justice is done. The three words happily ever after speak not of the past, but to the future that's yet to be determined. And that is true for fairy tales and is also true for the personal stories that we often find ourselves working with here. And I'm reminded of one of my favorite quotations about storytelling from the art critic and essayist John Berger. And John Berger said, and I quote, stories are one way of sharing the belief that justice is imminent. And for such a belief, children, women and men will fight at any given moment with outstanding ferocity. This is why tyrants fear storytelling. All stories somehow refer to the story of their fall. When we first thought about this summit um, and we're thinking of it in relationship to the digital storytelling conference that, that, that we're hosting. Um, the two are very much linked and of course we're reconvening the conference um, next year and we hope to see many of you there then. Um, we thought about the theme for the conference and we called that story work for a just future. And there is, as I said, certainly story work to be done. And the conversations and debates today and tomorrow, I hope will help us set the agenda for the next tranche of story work. So I want in advance to thank you for your contributions, whether you're presenting or whether you're engaging in the discussions and the debates. Very much thank you for joining us. Um, I'd also of course like to thank the Institute for Advanced Studies um, for helping us, supporting us and hosting um, this summit. I want to thank our, our students for, for their help. Um, and of course, I want to thank um, my colleague, Dr. Antonio Liguori, who's put in a lot of the really heavy, lift, heavy lifting for making this event work. Um, and on that note, I am going to hand over to Antonia so that she can give some more thanks, I think, that introduce yeah, just, the next part of the event. Yeah, just some practical information. And I'm very pleased, actually, as we are talking about the future of storytelling, I think that we should also look after our new students. And I see I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Karen, who is with us, is a new PhD student. And today she's doing something, she's from Korea. She's doing a fantastic research project on a wonderful subject. You will hear about that probably in the future years. But Karen today, she's helping us with some very creative note taking. So I hope she will be able to share some beautiful illustrations she'll be drawing during these sessions. So Karen, whenever you want to, to share something, feel free to uh, share and let us know. So just, uh, I want to explain how things are working now. 
So we have two speakers today because we were expecting to spend some time just for introduction being the first day. And uh, each speaker, each fellow, each wonderful woman will be introduced by one of our new MA students. Uh, the student will read a short biography and then they will have 25, uh, each speaker will have 25, 30 minutes for uh, a talk. Then we thought that we want to keep the discussion for the second half of the session. But if you have any burning question immediately after the talk, please let us know. If not, probably after the two talks, we can have a, a, a conversation. I just want to say that each of you could have been a fellow because each of you is such an important part of the digital storytelling family. And, uh, uh, and so we are so pleased to, to have uh, uh, time and space and uh, uh, you know energy for discussions. Um, again, I want to say grazie mille from my heart, uh, especially to the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access, because without that experience, and in particular, of course, the director, Stephanie Nobi, who gave me the opportunity to be connected with Rookie today, which is something fantastic. And of course, my mentor when I was at the Smithsonian, Filippa Rappoport, and uh, a special grazie for Pino Monaco, who was my dear friend for coffee breaks. Uh, in Washington, so, <laughs> you know, and thank you all. Thank you, of course, for the beginning of my journey in digital storytelling. It actually is not a small detail, and it's everything thanks to my dear friend Federica Pesce for, from Melting Pro, who gave me the opportunity to meet Joe Lambert a, a long time ago. So we can start. I don't want to use more time for this. So, Tandrima, you can come and introduce our first speaker today, and thank you all again. Hello all. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Rookie Newell Ravi Kumar. She's the uh, acting under secretary secretary for education, and she is responsible for defining the Smithsonian's educational priorities. She concentrates her efforts on institution-wide educational initiatives, communication strategies, and funding for programs that benefit learners of all ages. A significant focus of her work is sharing the vast, vast resources of the uh, Smithsonian with the education community that needs the, uh, to support the needs of the K-12 teachers and students at the local and national level. She leads a Smithsonian-wide team that specifically responds to the distance learning needs of teachers, students, and families during the COVID-19 pandemic. She previously served as the, as the interim, interim associate provost for education and access. Prior to that, she was the director of education to 2019, where she can, uh, continues to contribute to the mu museum's education program. She draws from her international experience as a designer and educator to inform her human-centered approach to reimagining education at the Smithsonian. She's originally from Chennai, India, Vanakkam. She holds a bachelor degree in the history of fine art and drawing and painting from the Stella Maris College, India. A master of fine arts in uh, graphic design from Iowa State University and an executive education certificate in business from Yale University. Before joining the Smithsonian in 2019, she was an award-winning designer and the Associate Dean and Professor of Design at the University of Central Oklahoma in Edmond, Oklahoma. She has served in leadership roles at all levels of the American Institute of Graphic Arts and in 2015 was awarded the prestigious title of AIGA Fellow for her advocacy and leadership as a design educator. Please welcome Babi Kumar. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So it's your time, Rookie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much for including me in the summit. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'd like to share some slides with you before I get started. So I'll go ahead and do that. So hopefully you can see my screen at this point. Great. Well, thank you again. Um, that was a wonderful way to set up the summit today. I grew up in India um, in a developing nation where the population is large and the literacy levels are low. Um, education, irrespective of a person's socioeconomic background um, is seen as a key to opportunity in India. And with that level of pressure on education to decide your professional fate, 
the concept of teaching and learning through storytelling was not something I had experienced. I immigrated to the United States to pursue an MFA in graphic design. After successful careers in design and teaching in higher education, the linear track of tenure and promotion in academia had me staring down a path of administrative roles. My last role, as was said in my introduction, higher ed was as an associate dean for the College of Fine Arts and Design. I'm truly grateful to my spouse for asking me a really important and critical question at this juncture where I was thinking about a career shift. Um, she said, if you could have any job in the world, what would it be? We ask children a similar question. We say, when you grow up, um, what do you wanna be? Children answer unencumbered by reality. For many, they are more inspired by the fiction they are exposed to than the reality that they're surrounded by. As a kid, I wanted to be Batman. I was quickly told that this was not a job for a woman. Talk about a dose of reality. Let's not forget that this is a fictional job to begin with. The imagination of a child is often limited by the breadth of exposure of the adults in their lives. So going back to the question of if I could have any job in the world, what would it be? My combined backgrounds in design and education uh, made a position at Cooper Hewitt, the Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City, an absolute dream. Six intense interviews later, in 2017, I turned that dream into a reality by becoming the museum's director of education. In all my educational experiences as both a learner or an educator up to that point, I had not experienced teaching or learning through storytelling. In museums, however, the educator has to be a master storyteller. It's our job to connect the stories of the objects to the stories of the audiences and visitors who come into the museums. Storytelling at museums transcends competency levels, age, socioeconomic backgrounds, cultural and ethnic backgrounds. It is an action built on trust with an intended outcome of learning and engagement. That leads to an expanded breadth of exposure for adults and children alike. We use inquiry-based methods and teaching routines to make those connections. These questions, what do you see? What do you think? Give audiences and educators the permission to wonder together. In 2018, at the Cooper Hewitt, there was an exhibition installed called Bob Greenberg Selects. Bob Greenberg is an award-winning communication designer and founder of the international design innovation company, RGA. Greenberg has been a pioneer of advertising and communications industry for four decades. To emphasize design's key role in our increasingly connected world, Greenberg as a guest curator chose 42 significant objects to illustrate how technology has propelled design innovation in form, style, and function over 65 years. The installation underscored how historical objects point to future innovation. In one section, his arrangement of objects showed how the evolutionary pathway of multiple objects, the calculator, the calendar, the camera, had all merged into one object, the smartphone. Now, you can imagine that today's digital native generation is very familiar with the smartphone, but not so familiar with its earliest iteration, the corded rotary phone. On a tour with a class group of fifth graders, when I led them through thinking routines to make their thinking visible, they asked me with great wonder, how do you text with this phone? When I said, you didn't text back when phones look like this, the entire group burst out laughing. They could not imagine a world where your phone was simply used to talk to people. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell successfully transmitted his first message over the telephone. 144 years later, 
the design and use of a phone has changed from a communication device to a mirror that reflects the state of our humanity. With a phone in our hands, we feel empowered to be historians, journalists, and more importantly, storytellers. We share an edited truth of ourselves and demand an unabridged truth of our society. We document extremes of beauty and horror, and we play with the tensions between anonymity and exposure. We represent what we stand for with a hashtag. Tools and technology have leveled the playing field, creating equal access to opportunity and equal access to storytelling. The world has more voices, telling and authoring stories, asking questions about missing stories at museums and cultural organizations. At the Smithsonian, there are 19 museums, nine research centers, three cultural centers, three educational centers, and a zoo. What I love most about my job is the integrated and interdisciplinary stories I am able to tell that cross the physical boundaries of our spaces. Take the Hope Diamond, for instance. It's housed in the National Museum for Natural History, but her stories are more than scientific. This stone that originally is from India has a rich cult cultural story as well. At the Smithsonian, her story surprisingly extends into the Postal Museum too, that has an envelope that Harry Winston shipped the diamond by United States Postal Service to the Smithsonian. This acceptance that stories are connected, multifaceted, and serve as tools for learning and communication and archival is a behavior and culture change, much like the one we have made from holding a phone close to our ear to now holding a phone away from our bodies. When an object comes into a museum, it becomes domesticated. It's no longer out in the wild, interacting with people, gathering data. So in a museum, it's the layered, multifaceted stories that bring the object back to life. At Cooper Hewitt, with a single object, I can tell the stories of the object, its intended use, its actual use, the innovation, the design process, the story of the designer, their motivation, the risks they took, the failures they encountered, and so much more. Museums are rich storehouses of metaphors. Teachers and formal education systems are mining museum collections to tell stories to introduce content through non-traditional pathways and to ground theory in real world application that is relevant and relatable to the learner. For example, here in our learning lab platform, a teacher is exploring chemistry through the materials of spacesuits. And here a teacher is exploring math through art. Earlier this year, Smithsonian educators collaborated on a digital collection, telling the social, cultural, and scientific stories on mass as our nation grappled with whether or not to wear one. Last month, we collaborated with the, news, the newspaper USA Today and produced a 12-page publication with three visual time capsules connecting the stories of the past to help make sense of the events in the present. This publication was designed for old, older adult audiences facing social isolation due to, due to COVID. Since November of last year, I've had the pleasure of serving first as the interim associate provost for education, and then as the acting undersecretary for education for the Smithsonian at large. In this role, I've had the opportunity to develop a strategy that helps position education at the core of our institution's purpose. I've learned that we define education differently throughout our institution, but we all agree that education happens when knowledge turns into understanding and that understanding can be transferred to various contexts. To further explore understanding, I've used the framework that Wiggins and McTeague lay out in their seminal text, Understanding by Design. We see that understanding has six facets in their framework, 
explanation, interpretation, perception, application, empathy, and self-knowledge. Since we have museums and exhibitions at the Smithsonian, we explore the first three quite well through inquiry methods where the museums and educators play the role of storyteller. We're able to have audiences explain in their own words what they're looking at to understand the context and to interpret it by making meaningful connection. But to gain evidence of understanding by the learner, the story becomes a powerful tool yet again. It is, as I've said earlier, one of the most inclusive ways a learner can share their understanding of how knowledge is applied, how to empathize with those around you or with the people in the stories. And most importantly, what does that knowledge mean to you? A lot of learners today don't see themselves in what they're learning. And so this focus on self-knowledge becomes critical as we look at evidences of storytelling. This profusion of storytelling in both formal and informal learning environments has made the stories the new currency in our society. I say currency because even with stories, there are those who are represented and those who are not. What we have learned that there are gaps in our stories and there are stories that haven't been told. By March of 2020, our visions for the year were challenged. We all threw rule books out and we were challenged by the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and systemic racism. The fragility of life has never been more apparent. One pandemic makes us pause and the other calls us to take action. We find ourselves in a generation defining moment where the questions we ask today and the answers we choose to chase will alter how we define representation, identity, citizenship, and the value of human life. If we think deeply about storytelling over the next two days, let's challenge ourselves to not only question the voice, delivery tools, opportunity, and context, but if we believe in the human capacity for change, then let's apply that belief to storytelling as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the virtual applause. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, this was fantastic, by the way. <laughs> Are there any burning questions? Or would, shall we move to the second presentation and then we can have a broader and deeper conversation afterwards? Let me check in the chat box if we have anything. Yeah, I just say. Uh, Thank you, it was amazing as a general comment, Rookie. So thank you very much. Thank for... you, you're all very kind. You're a wonderful <laughs> virtual audience. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that we this will inspire uh, deep conversations later as we've been yeah, reflecting more on this. So we have our second speaker introduced by Celeste. Hi everybody, um, that was a really lovely talk, thank you. Um, I'm now introducing Elizabeth Galvin um, to the room. So um, Elizabeth is a anthropologist and a digital humanities specialist. She is the head of learning and digital programs at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, she works with the learning portfolio across the many Victoria and Albert sites for a wide range of audiences including schools, adults, communities, young people, families, and higher education, as well as the Victorian Albert Artists in Residence Programme. Additionally to this role, she leads the research formation and the implementation of digital programmes and educational technology to explore collections. Prior to joining the Victorian Albert, she was a curator at the British Museum, where most recently she was a project manager and a leader of a major digital collections research project. Her academic interests are focused on the intersection of technology and digital outputs in academia with traditional museum research, learning and engagement practices. 
as well as the complicated role technology can play with local source and communities engaging with material culture museum collections. Thank you very much and over to yourself Elizabeth. Thank you so much, that was very nice. Let me share my screen. Great, so that was a very lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Galvin. I'm the head of learning and digital programs at the VNA in London. Um, when I was first given this prompt on applied storytelling, um, I have to admit it was, it was quite a large uh, brief to, to discuss. And um, I knew I wanted to come at this from a digital aspect. It's something that Antonia and I have talked about for quite some time. Um, and it really just uh, got my mind thinking about showing how museums are using technology to make space for stories and how we can expand access to stories with using museum object narratives. The VNA is a national museum in the UK with a focus on art design and performance. Our collection spans thousands of years from ancient history to contemporary practice and covers most of the globe. One thing I often say about the VNA is we are an art and design, we are an art design and making in the present tense. Our history was founded from the Great Exhibition of 1851, and it was to build a, a design resource and reference collection for any maker to come visit and see. Because of this, we have close tie with making and process and using storytelling as a way for engaging our audiences, not only with collections, but with the creation process. We have collections from all over the world that cover thousands of years of human history, including contemporary practice that are coming up now. So you can see we've got a wonderful Dale Chihuly in our uh, entryway, um, and then some fantastic contemporary pieces next to some of our uh, medieval pieces. In addition to the millions of objects in the collection, one thing that the VNA is known for is the cast courts. These pieces were made in the 19th century as direct copies of the great pieces throughout history. They include Michelangelo's David and Trajan's Column, which you can see at the center of your screen. They are meticulous Victorian casts, electrotypes, and other forms of technology that were revolutionary at the time. In some cases, the originals were destroyed by pollution, overzealous conservation, and other factors, and these remain the only copies left. This gallery was created as a way for people who could not travel to Europe to see the great masterpieces and be able to understand and explore these collections. By using cutting edge technology of their time, the crafters of the space were able to bring in stories, narratives, and allow audiences to experience the collections along with understanding the object journeys. I'm using this gallery as a metaphor for my speech today. Using a broad definition of digital storytelling, how can we now use cutting edge digital technology in museum contexts to bring stories and narrative understanding to spaces, to use technology to understand and connect with collections and to invite audiences to use digital technology to engage with the museum collections when they otherwise would not be able to. Museum learning is a natural fit with digital storytelling. Understanding object narratives has been a cornerstone of museum education practice for decades. At the VNA, we have challenged ourselves to rethink what museum learning can be for the 21st century. How do people want to engage with stories, objects, and narratives? Our approach to museum learning is influenced by Kathy Hirsch-Pasek's six C's of 21st century learning. What skills do we want to develop in our learners? And how do, we, how do our engagement practices promote this? We have creativity, criticality, content, confidence, collaboration, and communication. We add our seventh C, which is our collection, at the heart of what we do. Similarly, we also need to take into account the context of what our learners and audiences are bringing into the museum. Globally, it is a time of major social and political challenges, and educators need to make sure that the context people are bringing into the museum and understand the challenges that that faces. Our purpose is to activate the world's leading collection of art, design, and performance, and the dynamic creative networks that we work with. We want to empower and enrich learners with design-led skills and understand, to understand the 21st century. And we want to inspire the next generation of artists, creatives, designers, and innovators. The first part that I would like to explore today is how museums can use digital technology to bring stories into the museum. 
Please note that throughout my presentation, I am referencing projects that occurred pre-COVID, so you will see unmasked faces and a lack of social distancing. Whilst the museum is temporarily closed due to UK lockdown restrictions, when it reopens, masks and appropriate social distance policies are in place. The first part I wanted to talk about was Digital Design Weekend, and I love this photo here because I think it perfectly sums up what we try to do with our digital programs team. Here we have a robotic statue, and the two little girls in this picture, you have one who is absolutely thrilled and one who is a little bit wary about where this is going. And I think everybody, when they engage with a lot of cutting edge digital technology, feels both of these, the, the excitement and the apprehension. Digital Design Weekend is part of London Design Festival that we host at the, at the V&A that welcomes over 30,000 people to the museum to explore technologies around one theme. We have lectures, roundtables, discussions, talks, all about uh, the around the theme of digital technology and digital design. And we also have pop-up workshops where creators can show their content and show different types of work that are creating. For example, this is the Emoshi keyboard, which challenged two people to hold a conversation using only emojis. Asking our audiences, how do we communicate, share stories, ideas, and ask big questions on how we understand each other in this world of new technology. Similarly, here is Mood Pinball by Boom. It features the work of neurodiverse artist, Eddie Joe Murray. As the pinball, one navigates an urban environment when, and when you bump into different pieces, it changes your mood. It is inspired by Murray's experience navigating a world as a neurodiverse person. Allowing the public to understand Eddie Joe Murray's experiences and narrative in a world that is not always accepting of those that are neurodiverse and differently abled. A particularly powerful and rewarding project that we were able to work with was Windrush Arrival 1948. It was out of Goldsmiths University, London. For those of you who are not from the UK, the Windrush was when the UK, after being decimated by World War II, invited citizens from then colonies to come to the UK to help rebuild from 1948 to 1971. It was called the Windrush after the MV Empire Windrush, a ship that brought people from various Caribbean nations to the UK. Most arrivals were of African Caribbean heritage. Although invited by government, many faced racism and discrimination in the UK. In 2018, as part of the UK's hostile environment immigration policy, many members of the Windrush generation and their descendants were falsely told they did not have legal status in the UK. This was not true. Some were even deported to Caribbean nations that they had not lived in for decades. This was because their original landing cards that had been the only official record of them arriving in the UK had been shredded and destroyed by government. Rose Sinclair, a lecturer at Goldsmiths, developed this project to explore the Windrush generation and the subsequent immigration scandal. Rose's research is mainly based on British African Caribbean textile traditions. She wanted the audience to understand the women's making circles of the Windrush generation, but also through the lens of the Windrush scandal and the discrimination that many British African Caribbean people were subjected to. She designed a program where you had to fill out a digital immigration landing card. You had to navigate an increasingly complicated system. Using actors from her university to play immigration authorities, it was intimidating, frustrating, and complicated process to navigate correctly. Along with the back wall were copies of landing cards of people who had arrived during the Windrush to give you a sense of reality. At the end of your journey, no matter how you filled out your digital forms or how it was printed, your landing card was shredded and unceremoniously handed back to you. And as you came out of the experience, you were welcomed to a space that was designed to look like a 1970s British African Caribbean front room. Using objects collected from many different groups, Rose wanted to mimic this experience of going from the cold and sterile space to a welcoming and brightly colored front room that celebrated African Caribbean heritage. In the space, you were encouraged to take your shredded print offs of your digital landing card and learn of the different weaving techniques of British African Caribbean women. Many of these women's making collectives were not only a chance to socialize, but a safe space to make and create. The narrative of the space and the wider experience did more to tell the story of African Caribbean women's making traditions in Britain than one single object ever could. It was cr the creative application of storytelling that allowed the audience to empathize with the situation, but also how making was a solace and a critical lifeline in times of trauma. Using storytelling to build empathy is a key deliverable of our work. 
We are grateful that the BNA was the venue for the UK premiere of the interactive VR experience, Queer Skins, a love story. In this piece, a viewer rides in the backseat of a car as a couple goes to visit their son's grave. The love story is between a very Catholic woman in 1980s Missouri and Sebastian, her gay son who had died of AIDS. In this, you will learn more about Sebastian as you go through a box of his objects in the backseat of the car, hear from his diary, and learn from the complicated relationship he has with his mother in the 1980s conservative America. I'm gonna play a clip now, so can I please ask you to mute, otherwise the sound might not work. He's been dead to you for a long time, hasn't he? Ever since James. When's the last time you spoke to him or wrote to him? He was a disgrace. To be so uncontained, to not have to worry about the edges of things. What is that but the definition of joy? Users were invited to go in the VR experience to engage with the story, to understand Sebastian, even though he was not physically present in the car. Can the things we leave behind tell the world who we are? Although the audience might not know this experience firsthand, there is a universality about a complicated relationship that has love somewhere in it. By bringing stories like this into the museum, it shows how, that objects do not exist in a vacuum. You learn about Sebastian in the VR experience by going through his objects and following his journey of what they tell us. Alongside this experience, the creators curated a room full of objects that allowed the audience to learn more about Sebastian and engage with it as much as they like. They could physically go through his boxes and see a collection that was built on who this character was and what was important to him. It was a complete sandbox approach that allowed the audience to engage with the story how they chose. And in this space, the character was real. They could keep going through his boxed up memories and learn more about who he was. This links to my next point about how digital storytelling can be used in museum contexts for understanding collections. For the past 10 years, the VNA has run a residency program for makers and creators across all media. They are paid, given studio space in the museum, and regularly engage with our audiences and collections. Every month they host an open studio where the public can come and learn about their craft and their various residency projects. This can be everything from ceramicists, fashion designers, sound artists, and other physical art to embedded design thinkers. And currently we have two youth workers in residence. We also have residents often tied to exhibitions that we are running. In 2018, we launched our video games Design Play Disrupt exhibition. It's important to note that this exhibition was not a retrospective on video games, but rather a show that explored how these outputs are the intersection of art, engineering, and storytelling. In fact, I would argue that video games are the most ubiquitous form of interactive digital storytelling today. As part of this, we were lucky to have video game designer Matteo Menapache as our resident. His research and work around the social contract of games and how we play games cooperatively versus competitively and what happens when other people playing game, you know the other people playing the game versus playing anonymously. We worked closely with Matteo to teach our audience about video games and how they were so much more than just a way to kill time. One program we ran was Hack Paper Scissors as part of our digital kids series and events we run during school holidays. These drop-in events allow kids to explore digital technology in new and exciting ways and allow them to learn about the world of digital art and design. This event hacked the game of rock, paper, scissors with objects in the museum. It was built in Scratch, a coding program out of MIT for children. We had the kids create the games that worked for them. We had fan elephant vase and crown dancer unicorn. They could use any object in the museum. What was key to this was not just building the game itself, which was using coding, but we had to come up with a story. Why did the fan beat the elephant? What was the story and social rules of this world that they were creating? Central to each video game is this concept of world creation. 
Narratives don't have to be linear, but successful video game designs are all about the story. During his residency, Matteo liked to explore these different rules and social experiments in both the digital and physical spheres. Coming out of video games, he also would explore storytelling, empathy, and understanding in tabletop games. During his residency, unfortunately, his grandmother passed away. She had dementia, and Matteo wanted to translate this experience into a game. One of his fond childhood memories with his nona was playing the card game Memory, where you had to match, where you have to find matches of face down cards. This framed his creation of fading memories. As you turn the cards over, frosted overlays would be placed on the words, such as mum, sister, and home. This made each card harder to read and harder to engage with the longer you played. He built up this game as a way about empathy, building empathy with audiences. How do you play and interact when your own memories are being blocked and changed as you go? Matteo workshopped this game in several of his open studios with different audiences to welcome people into his grandmother's world. The game, and the video games that he created over his work were a chance for us to use storytelling to understand different perspectives and to make space for stories in museums. Thirdly, I'd like to show you about how digital technology can be used for engaging audiences who normally would not be able to come and connect with the museum. These two pieces here, a cockerel ewer and a dragon bowl were part of a wider research project as part of the relaunch of our cast courts, the VNA Reach project. This project, sought to explore digital reproduction and design in art and cultural heritage spheres. How do digital reproduction change engagement? This piece here is a 3D print of that original cockerel ewer I showed you a few slides ago. When one thinks of a 3D print, it's often that cheap and plastic version, but really 3D printing has made for creative applications of casting, printings, and other forms of object reproduction. This one here is printed in gypsum and has that real porcelain-like feeling to it. We took these objects to St. Vincent's School in Liverpool to run engagement students with, to run engagement sessions with their students. St. Vincent's is a school for special education needs children who face sensory challenges and visual impairments. Many of these 3D prints in context, in this context, were better in many cases than handling collections or even an object alone. The children were able to hold it close for fine details. They were able to explore the ideas of making and materiality. Museums can be overwhelming for people with sensory and access challenges, but there's also a need for collections to get out of London. We are a national museum and therefore we have a national remit. Through using specialized 3D prints, we were able to see these objects and use them as prompts to engage with young people in a bespoke program that works towards their needs. Similarly, by using prints, we were able to make the objects more real. We could put tea in the tea caddy so the children could smell the inside of the box. Similarly, because they were prints, we could put water in the 3D print of the ewer, which is originally from the ninth century. We can show how it was poured. What does that feel like? Especially for a child with visual impairments, that makes an object so much more real than any object inside of a museum case. Using technology to bring museums to people who could not normally be able to come into a space is a key ethos of our program. We regularly run programs and events in partnership with Great Ormond Street Hospital, one of the leading pediatric hospitals in the world. Designed with their Gosh Arts Program and the Gosh Hospital School, we developed a wide range of programs to use digital technology to engage young people in the hospital. One event focused on our exhibition on Frida Kahlo. We worked with a range of children in wards, including renal, oncology, and the pediatric spinal cord unit. We worked closely with a fabulous nursing and play specialist team to develop a program that would deliver the necessary level of flexibility, but could also be scaled up for a wide range of age ranges. We had participants from the ages of three to 16. Frida Kahlo was in a traumatic accident that left her bedbound and disabled, uh, bedbound and permanently disabled. It was during this time during her recovery that she created several influential pieces of her work. She even had a special easel created so that she could draw them laying down. Many of the children we worked with were on medical isolation. This means that nothing can go into the rooms, not even paper or books. Often required to stay in the room for health reason, this isolation can be boring and lonely. So we wanted to think of how we could design a project to use technology and use Frida's story for allow the children to engage with that. Using tablets, we had the children create their own digital self-portraits. 
They could take a photo of themselves or their hands if they didn't want their picture taken and create a story around their self-portrait. Key to this was that all the tablets could be sanitized in between each session and we emailed their piece to their parent or carer so they could keep the art that they created while maintaining the necessary social isolation. I am my own muse, the famous Frida Kahlo quote, was a major source of inspiration for this. We spoke about Frida as someone who crafted her identity. No one, including external factors, could define her. Working to understand representative thought and storytelling in art was a key factor in how the success of this. This piece by 13-year-old Grace was heavily inspired by Frida's Borderlands. Although she said herself that she was not in a happy place, she wanted to represent herself in paradise. The dolphin represents her getting over cancer and the butterflies that surround her are her family members who are supporting her. She was even inspired by Frida's trademark flower headdress, so she gave herself one to cover the hair loss she had lost from chemotherapy. While the Frida Kahlo project was a great chance for us to work with children firsthand, we wanted to see how we could amplify our work to bring the museum to more children in hospital and special education needs spaces. The VNA objects were scanned in high resolution as part of the REACH project we spoke about earlier. So we went back to the scans to see how we could combine our work with 3D printing and storytelling to engage more children at the hospital. So here's an example of our high resolution scanning that we were working on. Three pieces were chosen to create a multi-unit and multi-sensory activity suite around animals. It included this sculpture of two bear cubs from Japan, this 16th century bronze octopus that is likely Flemish, and this 19th century crab that is also from Japan. We worked closely with 3D printing company in Oxford called ThinkSee3D to develop these pieces in different materials so they could be used with neurodiverse children and those with sensory challenges. As you can see, we would print the object, the company would print the object and then use that as a cast mold and then we could cast it in various different materials. This octopus, for example, was then printed in medical grade silicone. It can be squeezed, pulled and engaged with the bronze sculpture is just not possible. And most importantly, we can sanitize it in between each child's use. But with us creating these pieces, we wanted to ensure that they were meeting the needs of educators. In this photo, you'll see the heroes that are the Great Ormond Street Hospital School teachers who teach all levels from nursery to high school with one of the widest range of special education needs in their students. How could we work with them to co-design a program that brings museum object-based learning into their classroom sessions, but also uses creativity and storytelling in this setting? We had run some teacher workshops. So this is one of our teacher workshops here where we ran a test of activities to get key feedback. This one was led by one of our current residents who is in the back standing up, Gail Chong Kwan, who is passionate about creative education and bringing making into the classroom. We looked at ways that we could tell the stories of how objects were created. In this one, teachers used aluminum foil to make a cast mold of their hands. Another activity was to use the 3D print in a new way and make up a story about this object. Here you can see the crab being used as a pencil holder. We also built on a lot of our existing special education needs activities, including how to link different objects with other things based on senses. We developed this teacher resource for hospital educators working with children to bring the museum to them. Um, we're lucky that the 3D prints are in the hospital now because we can just mail them to them along with other digital resources that we have that. So we're allowed to, obviously we're not allowed to visit the hospital right now, but the teachers are able to continue to run these programs. This includes using the 3D prints as storytelling prompts to create the voyage around their room inspired by the 18th century books. This one asks the children to look in their room and create an entire story with the different prints as they sit on there. How can we change a child perception of their space using narrative structure prompted by creative uses of digital technologies? We are proud to say that the first 3D prints are now in the hospital school and they're being delivered. Uh, we delivered a virtual teacher training session last week to think about what objects we wanna print next and where we wanna take this project. It isn't always the digital output that is the story. Sometimes we can use digital technology as the prompt and encourage storytelling in real life. As you will see from these examples, digital storytelling has broad application and can be presented in new and exciting ways for audiences to engage with museums, but also to create a space for people to bring their own stories into the museum. I am purposely ending this talk with this one last activity that is designed to build empathy and start thinking about stories with a light touch digital activity. Whilst we have spoken about larger scale interactivity, VR, 3D printing, 
There are plenty of smaller scale activities that act as prompts to include different narratives and stories in museum spaces. This is a copy of our weekly blog post aimed at seven to 11 year olds called Let's Make Wednesdays. That's all around making and engaging with the collection. We are acutely aware of the digital divide and young people in digital poverty. As COVID has, made us more, COVID has made us more aware than ever, the gap between the wealthiest and poorest students is growing. Therefore, we need to look at digital technology and how it can be reached on several levels for increasing access to the museum, but also crucially access for museum learning. These activities posted online and shared on social media are designed for families where they may be sharing a mobile phone for internet access. Whilst the activities are shared digitally, they are meant to be completed offline. This one for Refugee Week, an annual event we host where we highlight and celebrate refugees, their resilience and their contributions to our community. We use storytelling to not only engage young people with the collections, but to use the objects made or featuring refugees, including this Chagall piece, that green and purple piece in our collection, for example. Learning about refugees through the objects that they made helps our audience understand their stories and their perspectives. Through a physical making activity, we ask the children to design an object that can make someone feel welcome using everyday materials around their house. Digital technology for storytelling can not only be the medium in which the stories are created and presented, it can also be used as the prompt for increasing access to our collections. Through storytelling, audiences can better understand that no object exists in a vacuum. They each have their own journeys, their own narratives, their own meaning, and this can change based on your perspective. Our role as museum educators is to help find and create and crucially make spaces for these stories. Thank you. Great, it's time for us now to open the floor for discussions. Yeah, I saw there were some comments during your talk, Lisa, and something very enthusiastic coming from Joe Lambert about, I think he loved the piece of the virtual reality, but that was mm -hmm. just a prompt just to start and kick off the process. Before we do that, I want to... In terms of note-taking, creative note-taking, uh, and then if you want, feel free to jump in and share your beautiful drawings. The other thing I want to say is also that I'm, I'm happy to welcome our Dean of the uh, School of Design and Creative Arts. I can see uh, Kay's just joined us, so I wanted to welcome him as well. And I see so many uh, friends and beautiful faces around this. So it's now your time actually to, to ask questions and start conversations. Uh, one more thing, as I always do, <laughs> there is always one more thing. Uh, I want to specify that this summit is something that has been also supported over time by all the conference committee members. So I would expect them to be really actively involved in this discussion now. And I want to just mention all the institutions involved in the co-organization of this two ambitious two-year plan of events here in UK and in the US, hopefully in 2022. Um, so we've got our group of colleagues from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. We've got our Smithsonian family at the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access. We've got our wonderful colleagues at the Montgomery College in the US. And then we've got in the UK, uh, our colleagues from Patient Voices. I see Tony is there, probably mm -hmm. Pip is there too. Uh, we've got, of course, Joe Lambert from the Story Center and from GISC, we've got Chris, I saw Chris earlier, so, and colleagues from South Africa, we've got Daniela Gachago as well, and, uh, oh, I see Sarah Duzzi from the Montgomery College too, and so if you want to start those conversations, that's just to break the ice, and then feel free to probably write in the chat box uh, a that you are happy to, to, to ask a question. So it's easier for us to manage uh, the, this uh, part of the summit. Okay, I see that Tricia is writing amazing. Thank you. I'd love to share both with our museum interpretation students at Goldsmiths. Yeah, thank you Tricia for your comment. Handle. 
Yeah. Okay. So while people are thinking, maybe I can, I can start off with a, a, a question then. Um, and, and it's kind of inspired, well, by both, both of the presentations, but I, um, I was very taken by something that, that Rookie said around um, the stories that were missing. Um, and um, that idea, I'm very taken by that idea of, of um, absence or, or pre absence and presence or, or how something that is absent can be present uh, and the kind of the deafening sound of silence. Um, and you also said that we're, um, we're currently in two pandemics, that of COVID and that of, of racism. And, and um, earlier, so this is a very long winded question, but I'll get to the point in a moment. Um, um, earlier on, I, I quoted John Berger and another thing that John Berger said was he once called zoos um, palaces of colonial plunder. And now I can say that because I don't think we've got any zoo keepers with us in the group today, but he could just as easily have been talking about universities and about museums as well, in, in a way. Um, so I'm just asking a question as to what we as, as storytellers, what our role could be or is in addressing those silences, in dress, addressing the things that are missing um, as we go forward? Not an easy answer. I'm not expecting an answer, but, it, but, it, but maybe just, uh, just to throw that in as part of a, um, a way of, of, of opening a discussion. That's a, that's a great way to open a discussion. With, that's, that sounds like a really incredible question. I think about how, at least in the corporate world, we have shifted to very data-driven decision-making. And part of that data-driven approach is where I think about what do gaps in data tell us as well? And I think we can apply some of that thinking to storytelling. Um, often with data, we tend to look at averages and Sometimes when you correlate and actually look at each individual entry and compare it to the average, there are several talks on this. There are differences there that the, the individual response is nowhere close to what the average was. And in all of that, you start to see that there are discrepancies, there are gaps. Um, and sometimes I think if we took the approach of data-driven but people-informed, where we complete our thinking with the stories, I think we would be more effective with decision-making. And so this is sort of where I think about the role of stories is in some ways it completes the thought, it adds more context, it grounds um, evidence in, in reality, and it in some ways gives it a face so that we're not just talking in abstract terms, but we realize at the end of the day that we are talking about people, their stories, their contributions. Um, so that's, that's a long, uh, a roundabout way to get to what you're thinking about, but the gaps for me are very prompted by, at least in leadership roles, how we talk about data often, but we forget to make those connections to, to real people, real environments. And that has a, a ripple effect. Um, also, I think you made a really powerful point about um, you know, colonization and um, how some of the stories that we have in our museums today, how did they even get there? Um, and for a lot of museums, they did get their start because somebody thought it worthwhile to attribute value to certain objects. And that's really what started a lot of collections, but it comes down to that particular person's um, sense of value and, and in that creates a divide. So not everyone has had access necessarily to collecting and having their collections put in museums. We've also assigned value at different points. And so the stories tend to change and, and this in turn has created gaps. When I do walk around audiences from different backgrounds, often the question you get today is they wanna see something that's a version of them in the collection. So at Cooper Hewitt, when I would walk students around, 
I'd see young women who want to know who are the women designers in the collection. And we don't tag collections that way. We don't tag them by, by gender of the designer or so ethnic background. And so when you have someone who wants to find a, a, ver, a future version of themselves or, or a role model, uh, it comes down to what is that story we decided to tell when we collected? What are the attributes that we decided to hold on to as things of value? I think these together, that decision-making, that process that we have worked through has in some ways created some gaps. Um, and I do think what you're doing with the summit in some ways can help fill those gaps. Thank you very much. I see there are many questions yet coming from the chat box. And in particular, I see Joe and Chris have been very active about this. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask directly the question, and then we'll go back to the chat box again. Well, I mean, part of it was that uh, both of you guys represent public spaces and public spaces are greatly affected by the pandemic and uh, will audiences change and what is the role in, of story and, and kind of connection to story in this kind of hyper digital communication moment when we're all in the Zoom space. And so it, it's sort of a question for a lot of us is, you know, um, there are certain things we don't feel we can do in a mediated environment, like a lot of sensitive work that is trauma informed. We find we're 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 sort of waiting <laughs> for this to come to the other side. On the other hand, it seems like a lot of people are just figuring it out because they have no choices, whether that's going to a therapist <laughs> via their Zoom call or doing group, you know, dynamic kind of work. So it's sort of a question of, does the pandemic change anything? Is the post-pandemic work in this area significantly different? Do we see patterns in that? And I, as museum people, I, I would think that question is really um, important to you. Yeah, absolutely. I can, I can jump in there. Um, first of all, first of all, Sorry. Um, how museum education was run and how it's run now, um, I feel like we're kind of you know, on a different planet. Um, you know, obviously we have kind of our basics and our, our learning from it, but it's mainly about being responsive and adaptive. Um, we really, uh, at the VNA, we try to be design led and user centered in how we approach things. And, you know, as I said, we had all these wonderful, you know, performance strand. Per you know, pop-up performances with young people as they were engaging in, in the galleries that just aren't going to happen for quite a long time and various other types of, of strands that are, are fundamentally shifting. But from my perspective with my team, it's about keeping the ethos of what we do and the ethos of what our audiences are and how can we keep that and then translate that often into a digital sphere. Um, so for example, we've run projects with uh, people who have dementia um, and obviously, you know, given health concerns, we're not able to run those and we don't want to run them via Zoom. Um, no indictment of Zoom. I just think it's not the right medium right now. But what we've been doing is seeing how working with kind of uh, art therapy partners to see how we can do phone call sessions. We're developing a set of resources for carers, for people in care homes who, with uh, people who run dementia so they can run art therapy courses so we don't physically have to go there. Um, it's, it's about finding ways and being user centered. And I think one of the big things is also having a degree of flexibility we're not gonna be able to compose, you know, the most amazing film that we would have been able to do when all the staff are in the museum space. Um, so I think we have a lot of, we're lucky that we have a lot of flexibility in how we'd like to approach that. And we wanna use our outputs and wanna use our uh, experience of, you know, as educators at the core of what we do and as museum professionals to keep that ethos and to deliver something that is tailored and user-centered. Um, it might not be exactly the same thing, but it's something, and if anything, kind of my last point that I was trying to make, we crucially need to keep the digital divide in context here, not just in the UK or in your environments, but globally, especially when it's coming, uh, you know, as was mentioned in my bio, I'm especially interested in access, you know, of local and source communities for many objects that exist in museums outside of those spaces. How do we make sure that people are able to access these? How do we make space for narrative and stories from different peoples in, in the museum? Um, and 
this has kind of accelerated a lot of museums into the digital sphere much further than they were expecting it to be on their roadmap. And so I think I'm excited to use this opportunity as a chance to be very user centered to look at our audiences and to see how we can just be flexible and, and pilot and iterate and try. You can make a great question. point, Elizabeth, and that was some of our challenges, at least as COVID started. I think, first of all, I think we conflate um, virtual with digital often, and they don't necessarily need to go together. Um, I think there's lots of digital ways that we can connect that, that are maybe low tech that don't need broadband. And these are, I think, questions that we are asking. When it comes to, I think, digital or storytelling, I really think it's about the questions we ask that prompt how we solve those problems. I know at the Smithsonian, um, our approach was initially to support distance learning, but the more we learned about just how big the digital divide was, instead of trying to go through the route of how do we get devices into the hands of people, which is not what the museum's area of expertise is. We ask the question, how can we get content to people using no technology? And that really resulted in some innovative partnerships with newspapers like USA Today, where we printed uh, a publication for kids and we called it the Summer Road Trip Guide. And it had an imaginary, um, a kind of fantastic journey of the mind that you could take with interconnected stories. The piece that I showed in my slides yesterday today was for older audiences facing isolation. I think it's, this is really creative problem solving in a whole new way. Um, I think we lean on digital sometimes because it feels convenient, uh, but there are other ways to solve problems. Um, even access to storytelling, I think some of what you showed, Elizabeth, in your slides with um, the six degrees of separation especially stands out, where there are ways in which we can make those connections. I, I think about even listening strategies. Um, there's research that shows that children learn first through listening, even as their you know, fetus is 10 weeks old. And that's a, that's a strategy that we forget as we continue through formal education. Uh, but there's a lot that can be done through just pure talking, listening and storytelling the good old fashioned way where you actually sit and listen to a person and you don't necessarily need to surround yourselves with visuals and animations and the whole nine yards. So I think this comes down to what are the questions we're asking and how are we looking at these problems? I often refer to a Mark Twain quote that says if you, uh, uh, I'm going to paraphrase this, but if you look at every problem as a nail, then all your solutions look like hammers, right? Um, and so that's a good point for us to really ask, what is that problem we really want to tackle? And how is storytelling an answer to that problem? Thank you very much. Uh, I see that we've got plenty of questions now. And uh, I can read something from Michael Mason. So I have to say that we have with us today also two of the fellows who will be talking tomorrow during our second day. And one of them is Michael Mason. Michael, would you like to ask your question and unmute yourself? Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> and thanks for bringing us all together. I think this is a really interesting opportunity to reflect on our practice. Um, I guess I, I wanted to just comment that it seems to me that part of our work needs to be providing platforms and other tools for people to uh, share their stories. I think the, you know, um, Liz's example of the pinball sh machine that, uh, game that, that uh, mimics the experience of a, of a person um, uh, with diverse cognitive skills is fascinating as an example of that, a particularly digital game focused example. But uh, a lot of our work is about actually providing people with platforms to literally tell their story <laughs> in a way that uh, can be seen and heard on national and international levels. And that work is not, um, that's not instant, right? I mean, it, people have to find confidence they have to because stories are always told in relationship to audiences they have to be uh, they, they hone their story to figure out what works 
Um, so that we're talking about presentational skills um, of various kinds uh, and, and sensitivities to audience. Um, I guess I, I also just want to put in that um, a good storytelling is also always a performance and meant to change in some way the context in which it is told. Um, and that I think uh, museums as an important third space in our society uh, represent one context where the narrative about who we are as a society in the largest sense, uh, this is an international gathering, um, can really be transformed by introducing new stories. So um, thanks for the great presentations and thanks again for bringing us together. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Uh, I saw also a comment from Karen. So Karen is from Brazil. Could you please also introduce yourself before asking the question? Because some of you probably aren't familiar with each other and it's a great opportunity actually to meet today. Okay, thank you, Antonia. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this summit. Uh, I am Karin Morkman. I am the founder and uh, still director of the Museu da Pessoa, the Museum of the Person, which is a virtual museum of uh, collaborative virtual museums of life stories uh, based in Brazil. Uh, and it was founded in 91, so it's a long, long term history of working with uh, many different strategies of uh, life stories and collaborating online and this uh, very part uh, we are long-term partners with Joe and Story Center. And uh, we really have, uh, Joe has been here for many times and we exchange many experiences. We say our institutions are like me, we and, him, and me and him, and our sisters are like cousins or brothers and sisters. So I'm very glad to be here and uh, thank you and to meet you all. It's very good to be among this community during this strange period we are living in. So my, my, my question uh, is more, uh, though we had, uh, I, I thank you for both talks, very beautiful and inspiring. And my question now to both of you, uh, because like uh, both of uh, like Smithsonian museums and uh, the other museums, they are beautifully done and beautiful museums and beautiful collections and beautiful use of stories. But my question is, how can we use, that's a question we've been working here for a long time, uh, not just to engage the public and not just to bring interpretation or engagement, but to reinvent really the collections. We can, because museums are spaces of power. So uh, I don't think it's enough uh, to bring in the museum's invisible stories because there is, always someone bringing in. So how can we think story is a way of changing really the power to decide who brings in what? And I think stories are the, the main way, but uh, I don't, I don't uh, think uh, you need to answer that. It's just a question for all of us. It's a question we are always uh, looking here. Uh, just to let you know that that's a big discussion in Brazil and in Latin America. So I'm just, just part of uh, the first virtual museum of Latin America I was part of this meeting last week. And I think this is a big discussion here, how uh, not just, to, not the museums should bring in the communities or the people, but how people bring museums to their they have the power and they have the community, their communities to bring in their museums in their spaces. So how can we deal with this kind of questions in being institutions like yours, which I think it's uh, beautifully done and beautifully work and how can we invert the positions with stories? That's my reflection or, or question or whatever. <laughs> Well, Karen, that's a 
Great question and reflection. It's one of the questions I think about myself, which is partly why I connected stories to currency in my presentation. And something that Jamie points out in the comments as well is that it comes down to that power shift comes down to if you look at stories as currency, then, then there's those who have and those who don't. Um, and I think it's an important question for us to ask ourselves about what are those politics of um, influence and power uh, and ultimately whose stories are we interested in telling. Uh, more recently, I've been looking at how a lot of museums see themselves as destinations, as place-based experiences, but what they do, the why behind what they do is really about building a memory, a long-term memory. And then when you think about what do you want that memory to be, you start to realize things like gaps and, and whose stories have you valued over others. So I don't know if there's a straightforward answer, but I think these are important questions for, for people in our fields to keep asking. I, I completely agree. And I think it's it, museums right now are shifting the whole concept of what a museum. I think there's this big discussion in the wider kind of glam sector that, you know, galleries, libraries, archives and museums about power dynamics. I think that's, you know, it cannot be understated about historically how things have been done versus where we're going. Um, and traditionally, you know, when you think of museum kind of in its traditional concept, you know, you have your object, you have your label, maybe you have, you know, an audio guide. It's all about one way dialogue in that sense. It's all about who's holding the knowledge and who's the receiver of the knowledge versus creating a space where you can have dialogues around it. And I think storytelling is that really fundamental part there of how can you make space for multiple narratives, and multiple meanings around an object? Um, how can we build those in and recognize that? Um, one thing just off the top of my head that, uh, you know, kind of going back to my previous thing about um, what we wanted to do during the COVID landscape, um, we had, when we reopened, we obviously had limited ways that people could access the museum because we had to limit for social distancing. So one thing we did is made digital trails that people could access on their mobile phones via QR codes. And one of those trails that we did was written by our um, African heritage tour guides, where we wanted, to, it wasn't just necessarily about their objects, but it was their perspectives as being African heritage tour guides on the certain objects and why they thought they were important. Um, so, you know, it would take you to, you know, the Europe galleries, it would take you to all these different ones and why they thought these perspectives were important for their perspective as, as African heritage tour guides. Um, and I think it's that kind of thing of, instead of doing kind of a, a curator led just one way discussion of this is what this object is. It's recognizing giving a space to people who, you know, are interested in objects and want to tell you a story and bringing in their own personal experience. And a really fundamental part is recognizing the importance of lived experience in museums. Thank, thank you. Well, <laughs> uh, great discussions on the chat as well. So if you have a, a chance to read, there are references, references and brilliant links that I would invite you to have a look at. And so these are all fantastic. Because we are talking about this, uh, may I prompt a couple of people to say a few words about their way of looking at these issues? And I'm thinking especially about the work that Micheline is doing in Virginia in collaboration with the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, just to, to give a, a perspective from the other side. So from the people, the community partners that you know, the museums are working with. So I see Micheline Lavalle is here from Fairfax County Family Program. And I had the privilege to work with her wonderful families, the Latino family, Latinx families. Thank you, Antonia. Can you all hear me? I'm a little under the weather today, so if I seem a little, but I wasn't, I wasn't going to miss this uh, conference for, for anything. Um, well, I can tell you that, I mean, I'm really, really enjoying everyone's comments. Um, my name is Micheline Lavalle. I am um, the family literacy specialist for Fairfax County Public Schools. Uh, we are right outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, in uh, the state of Virginia. Uh, it is a very, very um, large county, uh, large district, uh, very wealthy with huge pockets of poverty. And um, uh, many of our immigrant uh, families uh, come from Latin America, Central and South America, 
and um, they usually um, are very marginalized. They, they come with very low literacy levels and very little experience in terms of art appreciation, opportunities to visit museums, um, very little exposure. Uh, the projects that we've been doing with the um, uh, Smithsonian Center for Digital and Learning and Access with Philippa Rappaport um, and um, the wonderful opportunity that I had to work with Antonia in 2018, in the summer of 2018, um, was amazing for us. It was um, our families, we had about 12 people, 12 participants um, attend this workshop where they created their own digital stories um, using um, also our partner, um, Beth Evans, who's here. Where are you, Beth? I don't see you in the screen. Um, uh, from National Portrait Gallery. Um, and we brought uh, these families to the museum uh, to look at a collection of portraits and then had them write their own stories uh, based on what they saw as prompts. And um, what we have seen is an incredible turnaround in the way that uh, these families relate with each other. Um, there was a huge um, intergenerational component to it because they worked with their children um, in these projects. And in many cases, the children told uh, their, their own story. The whole idea was that, you know, they would tell their story with the parents. But in many cases, these children who were like middle age, um, school age, like 13, 14 years old, wanted to tell their own story. They wanted to be kind of empowered. And so we came up with very beautiful uh, stories, digital stories um, that were told from the perspective of, uh, of a young adult and also from the parent. And what we have seen in the classroom has been amazing. So we, our program teaches English as a second language and also offers preschool experiences to families who can't afford a private preschool. And in this particular uh, case, we were working with um, uh, moms, mostly women, uh, with the middle school age children. And what we have seen, how that has translated in um, parents' advocacy in the classroom has been amazing. Um, also, uh, we've seen how, even though, the, even though our families were from different parts, they were all Spanish speaking, they're all very, different, right? Because it's not the same thing to say that someone from El Salvador or Guatemala is the same as someone from Argentina or Brazil. They have very different cultural traditions. We share sometimes the same language, but not necessarily the same customs. And so there was always a very separate separateness to the classroom. Everybody sat in their own little corners. And after these very inspiring workshops, we see that our families are much more connected. They're telling their stories. They're advocating for themselves. They're asking for help when they need it. It's just been, I could go on and on, but it has been a really very, very positive experience. And really with Philippa um, and Beth, we've been working on these different kinds of projects, bringing art, uh, having um, our families make their own art. Um, a lot of them have uh, had a focus of social justice and advocacy, and they have been really um, very tremendous in the way that the, the changes that we've seen in our, in our families. Thank you, Michelin. We just wanted to, to hear the, the other side, you know, to hear the voice of the community members to actually make our museums and galleries. So meaningful yeah so thank you for that uh, I thank you Antonia there is a, a great conversation in the chat that Tony is animating Tony have you got anything to share I see a wonderful question with a lot of ancient Greek roots which I love <laughs> can I say something <laughs> of course Michael sorry sorry Tony you will understand you know Michael very well he needs to talk now I was hoping he would say something no no I, I'm waiting for a Tony Okay, um, I was listening to um, listening to the wonderful um, shifts in 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 what a museum means. To me, 
when I was a child, a museum was a dry, stuffy place with glass cases. Moving it back to being uh, back to being a temple is really interesting. But is it the children that are going to become the muses, the new muses? Who will be the who will be doing this? Will they be creating their own stories within those environments? Rookie, Lisa. Um, I, I think that the important part of that is it's not necessarily who is making it, but are we creating an equal space where anybody can come and present their story and, and present what they're thinking in this? Um, I like this idea of, you know, kind of creating the, the concept of having this, you know, open forum kind of goes back to that concept of museums as neutrality, um, which I think is, is a hard concept that, you know, we need to be discussing in this. Um, Ideally, I think we just want to be able to go to a space where people feel heard and the people that they feel that they have their space made. And as Ruki said, the you know, absence and silence of what is shown in museum can be deafening. And, and how do we navigate this in a probably not, you know, it's going to be complicated and not the most straightforward of ways. You know, I think this is an interesting conversation for us to think about. We often I think when we think about education, we always delegate to the next generation that they need to be doing a lot of the learning. And we forget that as people, we are learning every time, everywhere. Um, and really this, we're in a constant state of learning that, that this is not about the next generation. This is about everybody. This is about present and future. Um, the exhibition that I'd shared, the Bob Greenberg selects with the, the technology um, story that I shared, that was an exhibition that actually didn't have any labels. And it was really fascinating to see how different people constructed different stories based off of their uh, connections with the objects. And so I think in that world of museum interpretation, where we have often had a singular voice. I think we're starting to open it up to how do we create a space to not just talk, but also listen. More and more museums have reflective areas for people to contribute their thoughts, for people to share their reactions. Um, and you can see that there is a conversation going even if it's not synchronous. And I think these are some of the more exciting things where it's not about, um, I've had colleagues say, it's not about just being a passenger on the experience, but really being more of a participant in the story. Thank you very much. Professor Michaelis Maimaris, would you like to add anything now? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first to say hello to all the old friends as uh, Joy, Pim, Tony, and uh, especially Burju, I didn't see you for a long Burju, so I'm happy to see you. Say uh, congratulations to the two speakers and uh, especially and, uh, uh, and more to Antonia and uh, Michael for what uh, you are doing today. Uh, uh, just to say, to not to add, two small things. First, that uh, we had, uh, as all of us know, uh, uh, good results uh, even in uh, inside the museums uh, when we use the intergenerational communication and uh, uh, learning. You know that uh, well, uh, but uh, I mean, I, I would like to uh, 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 sign that again, if you like. And uh, second, I believe uh, as an answer to what uh, Joe said, uh, about the post-pandemic -pand area, we have to work over a more uh, useful um, network of the museums. And as it was said by Mr. Mason about the need of uh, new platforms uh, that uh, they are very, we can say, usable and accessible, we must see platforms that uh, we have a collaboration in uh, a form of networking between museums. Could be very nice, for example, 
for uh, Greek scientists and Greek people also to speak about the, I'm sorry to say that, about the London uh, museums that they, they, they have our own, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, past. But is, is, this is not the question, this is one only thing. Uh, the thing is that uh, we must be at the same time in uh, more museums and uh, have a kind of a new story between uh, all these museums and have a kind of a visit uh, 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 with uh, someone to different uh, now uh, times, spaces, and so on. Thank you very much. Any comments from Ruki or Lisa? That um, I, I think that's a, a valid point about building collaborative platforms. Um, you had mentioned Antonia Stephanie Norby and her team before but there's a tool at the Smithsonian called the Learning Lab. Um, and it's a platform for, for that. It's for co-creating. Um, we have teachers who use it as a space to, to tinker as a, it's also a sandbox where they can search through the digitized collections of the Smithsonian and contextualize it in, in new and different ways to suit their particular classrooms. So some of the slides that I shared about teachers teaching chemistry using spacesuit materials and some of those were built in the learning lab. And I think that kind of platform where you can search, you can um, digitally collect, you can contextualize and you start to create communities of practice where others can then look at how you've contextualized, copy and share it. I think those are some exciting possibilities in the, in the digital world where co-creation and searching for content um, creates a lot of new opportunities. So I do think you make a, a valid point, but I think a lot of museums are, are focusing on how do we do more of that? And how do we also not create barriers of access for those types of platforms? Thank you for your comments. And we have here in our room today, Sarah Duzi, who is a champion of a new community of practice on digital storytelling based on the experience, the long lasting partnership with the Smithsonian, in particular, the use of the Smithsonian Learning Lab for what you were mentioning in your framework, Ruki, about you know, building understanding through empathy and self-awareness and knowledge as well. So that's fantastic experience that Sarah probably will share later or tomorrow. Uh, I see th there is a crucial comment that I don't want to miss from Tanya, from Tanya from UMBC, Tanya Lizarazo. You, you know, you, I know you did a lot of community work. Would you like to unmute yourself and share your question, Tanya? Because I think it's quite crucial. Hi, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I think that it's related to what Trisha also mentioned about like uh, the stories about how objects got into museums. And I wonder that if like when we're talking about like making these spaces like more inclusive, we're also like talking explicitly about stories of white supremacy, stories about imperialism and colonialism that affect like to this day how people interact or not with these spaces. Um, I actually, one of my projects is in collaboration with Afro-Colombian uh, women um, activists. And part of like what I've also been doing is like uh, trying to, to see what other types of like um, alternative storytelling is happening in the region. And of course, like uh, there's a lot of community museums that are reacting specifically to national museums who do not represent like black people's history at all to this day. So there's like this distrust about museums. And I think that this is maybe like something worth considering when we're trying like to talk about like audience engagement. Absolutely, I completely. There, you know, the provenance needs to be a major part of a lot of these discussions that, that need to happen and, and um, not shy away from how objects got into museums. Um, 
I, I think that that, you know, it's, it's almost one of those absolutes right now that kind of almost goes without, I mean, obviously it needs to be said, but it, it seems such a, a way that museums need to be going and need to be thinking about issues of provenance and thinking about um, how we can bring voices in from people. Similarly, um, as you were saying, there's just massive distrust. How can museums build trust with communities? Um, how, because museums need to do the legwork there. You know, museums need to be spaces where they're the ones asking themselves the critical questions of how can we as the museum professionals become a space that people feel heard, that people feel valued and that people feel welcomed. That is not, does not need to, you know, as you said, it's, it needs to be a lot of listening as well. And how through, you know, not just through community engagement, but through wider practices, how can we use storytelling to allow these spaces, to allow museums to critically and crucially listen, but also to amplify a lot of these voices and to make space for people that disagree with the museum as well, I think crucially is, is a key part of that. Thank you, Lisa. Rookie. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think sometimes it's the mindset with which we also do community work, that we not look at it as an act of charity, um, that we really look at it more as a process to um, for critical inquiry to, to actually get challenged on questions of what has been included and what has not been included. Um, I think those are the, the processes that are now starting to become parts of museums. I, I completely agree with your statement about provenance, um, but also think about that, that full, the holistic museum experience that it's not just about looking at the objects in there. It's it's the conversations that follow. And then how do you use what you've learned to inform practices moving forward? Uh, that there is in some ways from an educational point of view, a cycle. Um, and so I, I think it's important that we ask those critical questions throughout that cycle of engagement. Thank you, thank you, Ruki. I will call now Pam or Daniela. So I would like to hear the voice of, of our colleagues from South Africa and I see they've been very active on these issues in particular. We are talking about community museums. Pam, could you unmute yourself and say a few words and summarize what you've been writing on the chat box? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's so lovely to see you, first of all. It's lovely to see everybody, so hi. Um, yeah, just a point. So what, what I've been reflecting on is, is how diverse museums themselves are, actually. So we have this sort of amazing global center of excellence museums like the V&A and the Smithsonian, which have this enormous uh, resource. And then we have the museums I'm more familiar with, which are these tiny, struggling, hyper-local, community-based museums, um, often, yeah, kind of pulled together on, on out of string and prayer. Um, and just starting to think about how one might in, uh, get the resource flow going the other way, basically. So instead of objects traveling from, from the world into the cent central museums, how do you get, I mean, those 3D printed objects I thought were fantastic. I mean, how do you get copies of those objects back into the hands of the descendants of the people who made them? Um, to explore. I, I think that's, it, it would be amazing to start thinking about, again, that interaction between the digital and the physical and bringing things right back into less resourced corners of the world. I also question there about, um, you know, I think what Elizabeth showed about the 3D printing, that, that's an amazing, uh, and on a solution to taking those objects back in and giving people that um, the tactile experience of it. Um, but should we be actually positioning the object at the core of the story, um, right? And should, should we actually instead be positioning the purpose, the motivation, um, the, the use, the, the intended use? And so there's, there's more to that object than the story. I think about um, contributions made by people over time. And it, we remember them because of the stories that people tell about them, not necessarily because we can continue to still touch and feel them. And so there, I think I question, how are we prioritizing um, value there? And if I understand in that at a museum, ultimately you do want to see those objects, 
But in terms of continuing the conversation, going into communities, um, I think it's the story that actually has better capacity to travel. Um, and I think that's, and that's the place where I think about how story is multifaceted. I mean, every story at least has, at least has your version, my version and the truth. Uh, and so we can at least start there before we start to explore um, the object and everything else that comes with it. No, I, I agree. And I think what's interesting about that is kind of going back to one of my earlier points there of, I think museums are in this fundamental shift, whereas before people would go, you know, it would kind of be the experience where you go to see the one object, you know, you do the quick tick box exercise, you know, you see, we've all seen the photos of the Mona Lisa where, you know, everyone's rammed in there with their, their phone up just to say that they've done it. And it's that tick boxing exercise almost of, you know, you go to the city and, and, you, and you visit those kind of blockbuster museums. But I think what, especially through museum education of what I'm trying to do is, and what a lot of, you know, my colleagues in, throughout the world in different museums are trying to do is shift this idea of what, how, how can museums be spaces for these different versions of that? And with that 3D print, I just want to be really clear. I think that 3D print is a great way for looking at engagement as prompts, especially people with sensory challenges. But I do think that there's a, a I don't want to get into a world where we're thinking of using 3D prints as a way to engage um, source communities with objects that, you know, a, a substitute for that, because I don't think that that's, I, I don't want to, I think that that's kind of a, an equivalency that I don't, I don't want to go down. Um, mainly just because I think it's, you know, the objects do have power and they do have uh, space and what they bring and museums have a duty of care to make access to objects that belong to local and source communities. Um, and 3D printing can be a good way to engage people with learning programs around that, but it is not a substitute for allowing access for local and source community to engage with, with regular objects. And, um, but I think it's kind of going back to, you know, exactly what Ricky was saying about the story. It's how do we shift away from the object, which of course is at the center of it, but uses as prompt for wider stories and allow different narratives and different meaning to sit next to each other with different value, you know, without kind of having power dynamics and hierarchies of them. No, I agree with you about the shift going on in museums today, but I also have, you know, fears and concerns about really trying to figure out what a museum is, because we see, we talked a little bit about digital before, and there's, um, pros and cons there, because on the one hand, you have the big digital divide. But on the other hand, what I also tried to include in my talk was that with the anonymity and people um, having this sense of freedom online, a lot of the stories that we have told digitally come under sort of a, a scrutiny. Um, and you also have museums now that are called museums, but um, they're really more of entertainment value than, than engagement in the protection or telling of a story. So therein, I think there is some, as we ask the important questions, I think protecting what the essence of a museum is uh, should also be one of those questions that we ask. Thank you very much. Really inspiring conversation. So thank you very much. So Marsha, we are getting close to the end of these first days. So of course, thank you again for hosting us and organizing this through the Institute for, for Advanced Studies. I wonder if you had a few thoughts, uh, you and Mike, to close this session today, and then we'll meet again tomorrow at the same time. But before closing, I would like to check how Karen is going. I'm a bit worried she's so busy, but yeah. Oh, she's posted something up on the chat. Oh, there uh, is. No, it's a JPEG. Oh, okay, so Karen is sharing. I'm very curious to see this. So she's sharing her notes in the chat box. Ah. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we got our creative notes by Karen that we can all download from today. <laughs> so it's just fantastic. Thank you very much, Karen. And Marsha, would you like to? say a few words. Sure. Thank you. Sure. And, and, and thank you to Karen, actually, because one of the things, um, one of the things that was fantastic about the very first of the leadership summits that I was able to pop into and out of um, when it was hosted before, and, and, I've, and I've noticed some of the former attendees um, are, are here as well, um, and organizers of the first one, was that um, the whole building at 
at, at the um, Institute of Advanced Studies became full of kind of post-it notes and drawings and everything. And every space was animated by everybody's discussion over the course of the, of the days. And it was an actually fantastically, it was fantastic type of storytelling, but it was also very much emphasized how important the space and the tactility was. And I, I, I was struck by, by that in, in watching these presentations. Um, I just thought it was fantastic how, um, how the making process in many instances and the holding of the objects and the engagement with the objects um, create stories. And I was thinking so much of, 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 of artists like Sonia Clark or Nadia Meyer who have done fabulous projects um, rethinking and actually in many ways decolonizing institutions through, through um, contemporary fine art engagements with museums and objects, but that have encouraged through the pra practices either in the case of Sonia Clark, the, the kind of incredible unpicking of Confederate flags or um, Nadia Meyer, the, um, the beating of, of the Indian Act in, um, in Can Canadian institutions um, to, re to, to get people to tell stories, to, to find ways to use the physical and the material and the practical to get stories to emerge. And, and so there's this incredible overlap between these kinds of creative arts practices and these um, uh, I ideas around um, museums bringing education to a wider frame. So it, it was very exciting for, for me to watch that. And um, uh, on behalf of the Institute of Advanced Studies, I just want to say thank you so much for all engaging so you know excitingly. Tomorrow will be no doubt unbelievably thrilling. And it was very funny. And Antonia, what a what a um, chair you are! I was about to write you a note to say, are you about to give a five minute warning before the before the Zoom runs out? And there you were before I could even speak doing it. So um, look forward very much to to tomorrow's uh, event. Um, I won't be able to join the full the full event tomorrow, so I apologize in advance. But our Pro Vice Chancellor for Research is going to be um, around to welcome everyone as well because this is a very important. Um, activity for all of us and we are more than thrilled um, to to be hosting. Mike, Antonia, would you like to wrap up for today? Yes, we, we had Sorry, a technical we, problem, but we, we are back. We left the meeting momentarily. Everything disappeared on us at the, at, at the very end there. Um, so uh, Antonia just asked, asked me to um, um, to sum up, which I... I, I I think it'd be impossible to try and sum up the, the richness of the conversation that we've had. Um, and I'm not going to attempt to do that because um, I hope it will carry us forward um, to, um, to tomorrow. But it's been a fantastic conversation, very much enjoyed it. I just wanted to pick up on, on one thing and that um, Michael um, said, M Michael Mason. There are too many Michaels on this call, so I'd say M Michael Mason. Um, and, and that is the idea about change and stories and change. Um, and, and at the very beginning, I, I referred to the idea of stories themselves being changeable and being temporary and not permanent. But Michael made an even more important point for me, and that was about stories as agents of change. Um, and it was linked to that idea of, of, of stories being a performance in one way or another. And whenever a story is told, a change happens that nothing is the same again afterwards and it, it might be a, a an emotional change it might be a change in a in, in a voice being heard that hasn't been heard before it may be a, a shifting power um it could be some kind of change but nevertheless stories themselves leave leave traces of change behind them um for the benefit of antonio and federica i'll just very quickly quote or i'll probably misquote um, the Italian writer Gianni Rodari, who talks about telling a story as dropping a pebble into a pond and the ripples go out and continue, even when they cease to become perceptible, they're still there microscopically initiating change. Like, actually, he didn't say that because he said it in Italian, of course. Was but he, um, was even more beautiful in Italian. <laughs> it was. Um, but, but it's that idea of, of stories as being engines of change if you like, um, that I hope might, might, might um, give us something to think about in the context of the fantastic discussions we've had so far this afternoon. Antonia, let me hand over to you. So thank you all. And uh, I hope you had uh, a good and inspiring time. I'm really grateful to our two wonderful speakers. So really, really grateful. And I'm sure that all our 
storytelling family that is gathering today here would be very, very happy to come back tomorrow and follow on and have full on conversations and be inspired by the three wonderful speakers tomorrow. So thank you again, Marsha and, uh, and Case mm. and Rebecca, who are, of course, <laughs> part of this experience as well as we are. And thank you, Karen, for your creativity, for sharing mm. your beautiful uh, drawings and illustrations for mm. us and capturing your creative notes. So thanks again and see you tomorrow. Yes, see, see you tomorrow, everybody.